The Thin Red Line is a very different portrayal of war. In this genre, films often focus on one side defeating the other, but Malik's work is an exploration of war as an extension of the violence in nature. The film begins after Private Wit has gone AWOL. He's living with a Melanesian tribe on the island of Guadalcanal. Here, a memory of his own late mother is triggered. He remembers having seen a sense of calm in her as she was dying, an ability he considers a form of immortality. Wit then declares a wish to obtain the same calm one day when it's his turn to die. This theme of immortality is what I want to look at with you in this essay. Private Wit's view of nature and humankind is one that aligns with the philosophical movement from the early 1800s known as American Transcendentalism. It centered on a belief in the innate goodness of humanity. A similar belief seems to be either born or intensified in wit during his time with the Melanesians. It's as if there is more goodness here than in other human societies. And as mentioned, it's their way of life that sparks the quest for the so-called immortality of his mother. I wondered how it would be when I died. What it would be like to know that this breath now was the last one you was ever going to draw. I just hope I can meet it the same way she did. With the same calm. Because that's where it's hidden. The immortality I hadn't seen. But one thing to keep in mind is that this is a deeply romanticized view of the Melanesians. At first, life in this apparent paradise looks to be shielded from war and other difficult truths of life. Kids around here never fight. Sometimes. Sometimes when they see them playing. It's in stark contrast to life in Charlie Company, where Wit feels he has to endure anything Sergeant Welsh exposes him to. I can take anything you dish out. I'm twice the man you are. But his time with the tribesmen also seems to have made him view his fellow soldiers differently. I love Charlie Company. They're my people. Despite his newfound dedication, Wit still often clashes with Welsh. The two men view the world very differently. There's not some other world out there where everything's gonna be okay. It's just this one. Just this rock. But I don't think this should be taken literally. The so-called other world that Wit believes in is not something that exists beyond the physical world. This is about how they, as human beings, relate to the world and the people living in it. On that note, American transcendentalists also believed in a unity of all creation, an idea which we find wit contemplating too. Maybe all men got one big soul, who everybody's a part of. All faces of the same man. One big self. Welsh, on the other hand, is his opposite. He does not see himself as part of a greater whole. He's an individualist who survives through separation from others. You ever get lonely? Only around people. Only around people. Later, Train's voiceover perfectly captures the difference of Welsh and wit. One man looks at a dying bird and thinks there's nothing but unanswered pain. Another man sees that same bird, feels the glory. In essence, the loner spirit Welsh sees nature as a threat to himself, while private wit looks empowered by how neatly nature is webbed together. Now in my view, the conflict between Staros and Tall, which is a big part of the film, mirrors wit's internal struggle with regards to nature. A struggle which we could rephrase to make it clearer. How can wit meet death with calm when the world can be such a cruel place? It's really difficult to make sense of the violence and suffering inherent in nature while also believing that humankind is ultimately good. This is what theology and philosophy calls the problem of evil. Traditionally, it sounds like this. Why is there evil in the world if God is good? In the film, a variation of this problem is vocalized. This great evil 
Where's it come from? How did it still end the world? What seed, what root did it grow from? Does our ruin benefit the earth? Does it help the grass to grow, the sun to shine? Is this darkness in you too? So how does this tie into Staros and Tal's conflict? Let's take Staros first. He is deeply religious and does everything he can to preserve the lives of his men. His reflections also point us to American transcendentalism, as if he was speaking directly to wit. Do you imagine your sufferings will be less because you loved goodness? Truth. In Colonel Tall's eyes, Staros is simply a coward, and there is some evidence to suggest he's not being completely unfair. What are you doing laying down there where you can't see a damn thing? Observing, sir. Just send first platoon forward to the ridge, sir. How many of them were hit this time? Tall himself, on the other hand, is the extreme opposite. He has little concern for the lives of his soldiers, and is motivated by the advancement of his own career. Here, he presents his own outlook on nature in very clear terms. Look at those vines, the way they twine around the trees, swallowing everything. Nature's cruel, Staros. Within such a view of nature, there's little to no altruism, which perfectly supports his own egotism. These two very different positions on sacrifice relate directly to Witt's character arc. One is willing to sacrifice his men, while the other won't make any sacrifices at all. Witt, however, finds some sort of middle ground by giving up his own life for others, which we'll get to in a minute. First, we need to look at the second visit to the Melanesians. It marks an important shift in his perspective. What seemed like a pristine paradise, free of suffering, now has the material reality of death and disease creeping into it. It seems Witt's romanticized community is also vulnerable to division and the suffering inherent in nature. Therefore, one could say Witt's transcendental vision of immortality and unity has been balanced by mortality and a true perspective on the nature of nature. Right after, Witt notices details of affection within Charlie Company that he previously saw only among the tribesmen, and he now stares at his fellow soldiers in the same way he stared at the Melanesians. For the sake of his character arc, there are a few details in this hut scene that are worth looking at too. Notice the birdcage here something we also saw in the flashback to his mother's deathbed. There's a repetition of a camera move up into the ceiling as well. In my view, these links might suggest he's getting closer to the calm his mother felt as she was dying. In the end, the mission that leads to Witt's sacrifice feels a bit like a throwback to the stupidity that Colonel Tall stood for. I'll go. I want you to know. I think the whole thing's a bad idea though. But volunteering for it is the opposite of going AWOL, and when he's cut up by the Japanese forces, it looks like he's found what he was searching for. It's happening with a sense of calm, and we would think a feeling of immortality. What's he seeing or thinking of here? Is it a sacrifice that asserts a connection to all of humanity and nature? Maybe it's liberating and comforting to know you're about to be absorbed by something everlasting like the natural world. And for someone like Wit, who senses a deep connection to every living thing, that must be where this calm feeling of immortality comes from. 